Thanks for joining us for this archive of Teaching American History's Documents in Detail webinar for Wednesday, January 19th, 2022. In this episode, Dr. John Moser of Ashland University, Dr. Scott Yenner of Boise State University, and Dr. Peter Myers of the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire talked about Frederick Douglass's half-slave, half-free speech, which is drawn from our Reconstruction Core Documents collection. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Moser. I am Professor of History and Chair of the Department of History and Political Science, as well as Chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government Program at Ashland University. And I'd like to welcome you all to another episode of Documents in Detail, Teaching American History's webinar series, in which we bring together thoughtful scholars to have a conversation about historically significant documents. We encourage all of you joining us this evening to participate in that conversation by submitting questions via the Q&A box. Please use the Q&A box, not the chat box, which we're not even going to open. So, but, uh, but we do really hope you will ask questions and use the Q&A function for that. We will try to get to as many of those questions as possible. Within the next week, you will receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation for being with us tonight, as well as a link to the archived video and audio from today's program, which we hope you will share widely. The speeches, letters, and other writings that we're using for this year's webinars are all drawn from the various volumes in our core documents series. They are also available at the Ashbrook Center's extensive, nay, voluminous document database located at tah.org. The subject of this evening's program comes from the volume on Reconstruction, edited by Dr. Scott Yenner. The document is Frederick Douglass's Half-Slave, Half-Free Speech, and to help discuss it are Dr. Yenner himself, he is professor of political science at Boise State University, as well as Dr. Peter Myers, professor of political science at the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire. Uh, both of these gentlemen are also faculty members at Ashland University's master's program in American history and government. Uh, glad you could both be with us tonight. Thanks for having us, John. Always, always a pleasure. So the way I like to open all of these is to ask why this document is, uh, is important. Why does it merit inclusion in a volume on reconstruction that of course already has so many other fascinating documents? Yeah, I mean, this is the final document in the reconstruction volume that, uh, that I put together. And uh, what I was looking for was some sort of retrospective on the whole process of reconstruction. Um, it, the, 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 act, the practical problems that, the, that reconstruction policy posed to the country were momentous. Um, how do you sew a country back together after a civil war? How do you free a formerly enslaved people? Both of those separate are very difficult things to do. And, uh, and then try doing them at the same time. And uh, that's what the United States faced uh, in the incredible challenge of reconstruction. And uh, it's easy to really moralize about the failures of reconstruction. But the thing that I found most fascinating about Douglas is his pretty good grasp of the, the great tensions between those two goals. And, uh, and his, I think, very sober analysis of what Reconstruction had accomplished and what it had left not accomplished and, uh, and what the path forward might be. So to me, it was one of the best uh, sober um, speeches or documents that really concerned a holistic evaluation of the very difficult problem of Reconstruction. Hmm. I would add a couple of just uh, two cents to that. Uh, what, one is a, a reaffirming of what Scott said, that you could trace to Douglas's thinking uh, even before the Civil War ended. There's a, there's a speech, I can't remember, I think he, 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 he said this, or maybe an editorial in uh, 18, it's either 1862 or 1863, when he said the day, he was anticipating Union victory, but he said the day the rebels surrender will be the most trying day 
to the virtue of Americans that, uh, that they faced. In other words, what he meant was the, the, problem of re the problems of reconstruction as uh, which of course, you know, the primary one for him was, uh, was full liberation of, uh, of those enslaved uh, is gonna be a greater problem than abolition. It, it, uh, it poses greater, more powerful, more entrenched obstacles than uh, even than abolition, which was of course a tremendously difficult thing to do. Uh, even uh, even even in its own right, uh, and otherwise too, I would I would add. I mean, I, I like this choice uh, as a as a, as a, as, a, as a speech because it is it's backward looking in the way that uh, it's a retrospective on Reconstruction in the way that Scott was saying. It's a retrospective on a larger trajectory of of U.S. history at the same time, and it's also forward looking because Douglas's speeches are pretty much always forward looking in, in one way or another. So we can we can get into all that. Hmm. So it, it it's clear that that Douglas recognizes that there are multiple goals to uh, uh, to Reconstruction, and some of those goals are in in tension with one another. Could you say some more about that and and uh, where he sees the, the, the major problems with Reconstruction, and, and is there a silver lining here? Yeah, well, let, let me start with that, and Peter can, uh, can back clean up. Um, in, in the second paragraph of the speech, uh, Link, uh, excuse me, Douglas has this great recognition of, uh, of, of this. I mean, I'm just going to quote right after the ellipses. Peace with the old master class, he says has been war to the Negro. And, uh, and, and what, what he's referring to there is the, I think, intentional policy of the North to withdraw the military from occupying the South and to basically return the governments over to those who were sympathetic to the cause of the Confederacy, um, so long as they didn't secede and didn't formally reinstitute slavery. And, um, and, it was intentional because I think there was a recognition that the first priority for the nation was to sew back the country uh, together after the war. It could not continue to exist as a country if there was a fifth column of traitors and rebels who were always lying in ambush waiting for the national government to turn its back. And the only way to really reconcile the country was an easy peace on the South. Now, I think this was learned after trial and error. Um, I know that uh, at the beginning of my life, I was a radical reconstruction guy, and I still kind of wish that could have worked, but uh, that, that the, the national government prioritized a return of home rule to the South in order for it to be able to act. One of the things that I, I pointed out uh, last time I taught this was uh, 1876 was the year that the last Northern troops were pulled out of the South. It was the year of Little Bighorn. Uh, there were wars all over the, all over the uh, prairie. It would have been a lot different if lying away in ambush were the Southerners <laughs> uh, waiting for defeats and perhaps even allying with, um, with uh, the Indian tribes who were fighting against the American army on the frontier. We can't take those things for granted. And, uh, and the, so the North, I think, recognized that, um, that the first priority had to be national reconciliation. And that meant like re-imposition of something that looks more like slavery. And, uh, and that was gonna be a longer range project. And uh, Douglas is of course pushing against that, but uh, he recognizes that this, the judgment that the, Northern, the Northerners made and uh, and obviously he's pointing out the the bad sides. Peter, yeah, to that I would I would I mean I, I agree with I agree with all of that, uh, and that there's a and there's also in 1876 there's a there's a certain degree of resignation I think on the I mean Scott was referring to the North, but the the Northerners are divided of course by party, but even within the Republican Party there's some there's some division. And the radicals had their day, uh, you know, circa 1870. The radicals got uh, uh, had for the past couple of years in their their opposition to uh, Andrew Johnson had uh, had gotten a lot of things 
a lot of things passed, a lot of, of uh, what should we say? I mean, fairly aggressive reform legislation passed, culminating in the, in the 15th Amendment. Um, but they lose substantially in the 1874 elections, the, the, the midterm elections. They know that the country's, by 1876, I mean, they know the country's pretty much exhausted. Uh, and unwilling to support a really uh, uh, a, a radical Republican program. And the radical Republican program, in contrast to what Lincoln wanted to do, really was going to be, uh, um, I don't know if I want to use the word punitive, um, but it was going to be very coercive. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that I think the radical Republicans really were envisioning an extended or at least the program would have required if they had it, if, if, uh, if, if they got it to work, would have required an extended occupation of the, of the ex-rebel states that the country just didn't have the patience or the, you know, the, 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 the morale, the energy at that time, at that time to support. So it's sort of an inevitability, but what you wind up with is in a way doing I don't want to be too hard on reconstruction because I think that the, the important things were accomplished. But in a certain sense, they took the worst possible course. They, they didn't take the course of, um, of trying to build on the Southern Whigs that, that Lincoln wanted to take. Uh, they, they pushed the most, uh, the most aggressive understanding of, uh, of how to win, of, uh, of the, the, the rights of the freed people to be written into law right away. Uh, including again, I mean, I know the Fifteenth Amendment doesn't exactly confer voting rights, but including the the Fifteenth Amendment, um, and then they, you know, so they took this radical course, and then they didn't enforce it, um, and uh, and that that I think was the, in a way, was the worst of the of the possible alternatives, and uh, and so they bred a lot of hostility. They probably created a lot more sympathy. For the Southern Democrats than they needed to, um, and then uh, and then left them to to rule the South after after 1877. So what we have here in uh, Douglas's speech is largely sounds like a, a glass half empty uh, story, but it, it, in some ways th there's something in the glass, right? It's it's it, it's it's hardly uh, completely empty either. Uh, what, what does he see as the as as areas of progress, and 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 what does he really focus on as the work to be done in the coming years? I could I could talk to that a little bit. I think I'm the <laughs> I'm the hopeful this guy, and and uh, and uh, I think you're you're right. I mean, I I think the thrust of the speech really is not gloom. You know, he starts out that way. Uh, he says the sky of the American Negro is dark, uh, but then he goes on. It's not rayless. It's stormy, but it's not cheerless. Um, and uh, and if we if if we uh, had access actually to the Fuller speech, this this dimension of his argument would come through even more fully. Um, when we were talking a few minutes ago, just a paragraph or so down, I'm still in the in the collection. I'm on page 160. If anybody's following along. When uh, Douglas says the moral government of the universe is on our side. Now, Douglas has been saying things like that for decades, actually. He said those things in uh, his, uh, uh, in some cases, almost in the same wording in uh, the abolitionist segment of his career. And he's still saying them now. And it's not mere rhetoric, it's not just trying to let's you know let's put a nice face on this let's cheer up let's move forward um and it, it is also not just as some scholars think it is just an expression of uh, uh, a, a religious faith a providential faith uh, i think there's an element of that but it's uh douglas thought that douglas had a natural law argument and uh and he thought that there was both evidence in human nature and evidence in history and also in US history that supported the idea that um, the natural law is over time effective. 
and that the, the, the moral government of the universe means that, that human history over the long sweep of it, and especially American history, can sustain a progressive interpretation. I don't mean progressive in a partisan sense, but just the sense that there is uh, a trajectory of progress. And he sees that in US history, and he sees it even in this portion of US history that dates back to, uh, to DC emancipation. Remember, that's the, that's the occasion that he's talking about here. He's, he's looking back to uh, uh, what's been done here since, uh, since emancipation in the nation's capital. You know, what's been done over the last 21 years. Um, and he really, despite all the difficulties, he has a kind of a positive, a positive review of things. There, there's considerably more to say about that theme, but I don't want to get into a lecture. I, I imagine Scott's got something to say too. Yeah, I mean, when um, I have this book uh, that when I was doing the volume, um, I referred to a lot and it's called uh, The Two Reconstructions, the, the Struggle for Black Enfranchisement by Richard Bellelli. And um, one of the things that he shows is that really the, the problem of voting, Blacks could really vote until about 1890. 1890 is the time when, for the first time, Democrats took total control of the government. House, Senate, presidency. And they basically defunded the attorney general's office, who had been on ongoing oversight over, um, over the South uh, and, you know, actually enforcing the law, uh, uh, the, the voting rights laws uh, that were passed pursuant to the 15th Amendment. And I'm not saying that, I mean, he doesn't talk about that in the speech, but he also doesn't overly complain about the situation of voting rights. He complains about, I mean, when you look at it, and these seem to be like kind of legitimate complaints. Um, he complains about mob violence on page 161. He complains about the inability to uh, receive a fair trial uh, on page 161, uh, about not being able to be hired, not being hired as a builder or a mechanic or being taken as a client uh, from a lawyer, not being able to be a doc doctor. The presumption is always against him in employment. And, um, and, and then, of course, uh, the mob violence, he says, is never rebuked in the press, never rebuked in politics. Um, you know, no one is really fishing for their votes. And uh, so the thing that, you know, the, uh, how do you, as a national government, protect the vote? Well, I mean, there are laws, and the, the laws are extensive. I have them in the volume. Uh, they try to anticipate all the various ways in which messing with the vote will happen in the southern states. It's a much more different kettle of fish, much broader power to actually oversee all employment decisions <laughs> and to oversee um, basically to enforce local laws. That requires a level of government oversight that, um, that is consistent, persistent, ongoing, deep, and, um, and you know, eventually uh, uh, corrosive of any kind of state control. And, uh, and that's where the national government kind of backed away um, from, from an interest in doing that. So when he gives the speech, another kind of ray of hope, um, according to this book at least, you know, about 70% of, of, of freedmen voted in elections up to 1888. And it was after that, that it's just the laws totally get gutted and, and go unenforced after Grover Cleveland, that son of a gun, uh, and the Democrats return to, uh, return to power. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a basic right to life problem that he is uh, talking about, but there's not an easy solution to that problem um, because of the difficulty for the national government to oversee all those elements. I mean, well, yeah, when you say, when you say, just a real quick thing, John, you, when you say the national government uh, and all the things that had to have, that had to happen in order for enforcement, you know, the additional thing that had to happen is it had to be judicially sustained. Yeah. You know, those, and those laws really weren't the, those, I, I, th I think you're referring, I'm assuming you correct me if I'm wrong to the, the 1870 and the 1871 enforcement acts and, and, uh, and the, the, the judicial power of the Supreme Court in a couple of notable cases just decided we're not really going to give enforcement to those. And, uh, and that, that over time licensed uh, Southerners, uh, Southern Democrats to, uh, uh, to uh, 
uh, intimidate the free people out of the exercise of the right to vote. Douglas does. Uh, Douglas was in, in other speeches. He, you know, he mentions it here, but he was in other speeches. He was very emphatic <laughs> about the about the importance of the of the voting right as a really. I mean, for a number of reasons, but but primarily for the reason of self defense because he knew that you weren't going to be able to rely on uh, on, on union forces um, to uh, to uh, to defend the free people's interests. So is his hope for the future that uh, that there will be wise legislation or is he looking more to a moral awakening? Well, I think you can't really have the first without the second in the in the, in the long run. Um, but uh, I think, um, yeah, that's a that's not an easy question. But I think Douglas's way of answering it, it, it might seem peculiar when you first read the speech, at least as it, as it did to me and maybe to others. Why does Douglas, let me find the passage while I'm talking to you. Why does he make it a big deal, a cause for optimism? When he says, uh, he starts talking about how uh, black Americans are a persistent subject of attention, of, of conversation. And, uh, and you wonder, okay, what really does that have to do with anything? And I think that when you, when you piece it all together, this is part of his, of his natural law, his moral government of the, of the universe argument. Uh, he says, uh, this is back on, uh, on 160 again, men of all lands and languages make him, the Negro, quote unquote, a subject of profound thought and study. Uh, object of intense curiosity, people want to know more about his character qualities and so forth. Uh, sentence above that, he's managed by one means or another to make himself one of the most prominent and interesting figures that now attract and hold the attention of the world. What, what Douglas is getting at there is a kind of moral sense argument. Um, people know deep down, some of them won't admit it, some of them won't live in accordance with the idea, but everyone knows deep down that slavery is wrong. Everyone knows that distinctions by color are morally arbitrary. So, so goes the argument of Douglas anyway. And what that means is this sort of injustice will always be a subject of controversy. It will always be, it will not be a stabilizing force as actually some historians thought it was, uh, still to this day think that. It will not be a stabilizing force in American politics. It will be a profoundly disruptive force in American politics because again, people have a moral sense. They have a natural desire for liberty. They recognize what a fellow human being is as opposed to a brute animal. Uh, and so they know the wrongness of these things and where their, their, their judgment isn't clouded by, by interest uh, or habituated prejudice, uh, these things shine through. But the controversy, the point is, will never go away until justice is done. So the persistence of this controversy is partly, there's much more to his argument than this, but the persistence of, uh, of, of, the, of the controversy is is part of the cause of his of his optimism. Yeah, it, it is a remarkable thing how often he says uh, the discussion. This discussion will go on. Um, it's a mantra in the speech, um, and uh, the 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 incomplete paragraph that begins on page one sixty three uh, kind of lays out looks like seven criteria, uh, all of which according uh, mm -hmm. the, end with this discussion will go on. And they're really all our basic liberal rights, uh, access to the ballot box, pathway to the uh, ballot box, the right to practice at the bar, um, access to the courts of the country and getting a fair trial with a just verdict, um, uh, participation in the offices and honors of the country and so on, are really all Republican virtues, liberal virtues, liberal or Republican virtues. And, uh, and because you know, they're grounded in nature, um, any, you know, any contradiction between practice and those principles of justice will naturally raise questions. And, um, and so I, I agree that, uh, with what Peter said initially that it's difficult to uh, distinguish between the moral reform and the legal reform. 
because obviously in some way, legal reform can actually help protect these things and make them more habitual, more sewn into the nature of particular places. Douglas, I think, accepts that argument, uh, but it's also get anything passed without the pre-existing support for those things. So, um, so his hopefulness, I think, is grounded in nature and in the persistence of the problem uh, that the freedmen face. Yeah, I would. I, let me follow up on that with a couple of a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is prompted by John something you said uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, this hadn't quite occurred to me before in quite this clear a way. But that paragraph, the one that Scott is just citing, that starts at the bottom of 162, the amendments to the Constitution, and then goes on. Um, that paragraph would bear close comparison with. Uh, uh, it's probably a few paragraphs in uh, in Martin Luther King's dream speech. When uh, you know Douglas says the amendments of the Constitution of the U.S. mean this, or they are a cruel, scandalous, and colossal sham, which is very much like what King says about the promissory note uh, going uh, so far unfulfilled, unredeemed, and then uh, those sentences that begin until this or this happens, the discussion will go on. You know, and then there's this repeated building intensity with this phrase: the discussion will go on. Um, is is very like a paragraph in the, uh, in the dream speech when uh, King gets into this, I can't quote it by memory, but he gets into this repetition of, you know, until this or this happens, we will not be satisfied. You know, we, you know th that's, that's something close to his phrase. We will not be satisfied. The protest will go on. And then it culminates you know, in the in the vision of America, where his children are going to be judged by the, the content of their character. And so here you see Douglas until the American people shall make character, not color, the criterion of respectability, this discussion will go on. There's a, it's a really striking set of uh, set of parallels there. Um, the other thing to to say, I think, that's a little more concrete as a cause for optimism than these um, pretty generalized natural law arguments. Uh, you, could, you, could, you could cite the very first sentence of this paragraph when he talks about the amendments of the Constitution of the US that <clears throat> granted the, the Constitution is always a subject of controversy and people have disagreed, <clears throat> excuse me, in his day quite sharply uh, about, uh, about what the Constitution actually means. Still in all, I think Douglas takes some solace or some cause for hopefulness in the observation that Americans actually want to be a law-abiding people, that Americans have plenty of, plenty of spasms of mob rule in, in US history, but nobody wants really to defend that. Um, Amer the, the Americans want to be a law-abiding people. Americans tend to revere the Constitution, even though they disagree about, uh, about what it means. And so that, that fact gives you something to build on. These amendments were written into the Constitution, which Douglas thought already was anti-slavery, but this makes it clearer, as Scott said in his introduction. Um, you know, now there, there is clearly written in the Constitution equal civil rights, equal citizenship, equal civil rights in the 14th Amendment, equal voting rights in the at least non-discriminatory voting rights in the in the 15th amendment and this means something you know that's not just going to go away so that's that's a sign of real progress the the dc emancipation is a sign of real progress in a in a somewhat different way but we can maybe come back to that point too right yeah so let's go to some questions from uh those who were joining us uh, heath treat asks when Douglas says, I long to see the Negro utterly out of the whirlpool of angry political debate. I want the whole American people to unite with the sentiment of their greatest captain, U.S. Grant, and say with him on this subject, let us have peace. Gentlemen, do you suppose he would be surprised to see that this is still such a major issue today? And what factors might he point to uh, that continually contribute to this racial divide? <laughs> That's a big question. <clears throat> Scott, you want to talk about that or you want me to, you want me to say? Why don't you start? I have some. <clears throat> 
Well, one part of the question, I, to me, um, I'm pretty confident about the answer. Would Douglas be surprised that uh, we continue to have racial contentions? I don't think so. I, I think uh, uh, you, can, you can find, not in this speech, but elsewhere in Douglas's uh, speeches and, uh, and, and essays and writings, you can find anticipations that, uh, I mean, explicit anticipations that uh, this is a problem that can go on, uh, he expects likely for generations and even for centuries. There's, I can't remember the, uh, the exact text that it's in, but he's, the context is he's talking about the Garrisonian idea of immediate uh, abolition, which uh, Douglas was himself uh, in some sense in favor of, uh, endorsed in the, in the abolitionist years. But after the war, he says, really, you know, there, there, there is no such thing. There never was any, any reasonable hope for immediate emancipation in the full sense that, you know, the, the, the power of the historical inheritance, the depth of the prejudice, the persistent reminder just in the very fact of color differences um, is, gonna, is gonna mean that this problem is gonna be with us for a long, long time. So would he be surprised? No, I think there are certain things that he would be disappointed by and I think, you know, as, as is often the case, even in the later 19th century, uh, there are things that he would be greatly cheered by uh, about, uh, about our own age, uh, about the, about the post-civil rights era. So I think Douglas would be, I think if he gave a speech today, it would be something like this one, except probably even a little bit more positive. You know, I think he would say, okay, looking forward, I think it's, it's a mix, you know, we've got a present condition in which things are not perfect and, uh, uh, and we've also got abundant cause for, for hopefulness. Yeah, I mean, I really would emphasize the first thing that Peter said. Um, uh, when I've been teaching the reconstruction uh, volume in one of my classes uh, at Boise State, uh, I've been also teaching the Tocqueville section uh, from Democracy in America on the yeah. three races that inhabit America. And he has a section on, um, you know, essentially white black relations. And Tocqueville is like not like, thinks this is a problem that will be managed till the death of America. There's no solution to this problem. Um, and, uh, and I think actually, of all, you know, Douglas is way more optimistic than uh, Tocqueville is, because he emphasizes, uh, you know, I would say the liberal principles uh, of the, the founders and uh, that were embedded in the Civil War amendments as the most realistic path forward. Um, the thing that I think is most valuable about, uh, about Douglas's prognostications in this way is near the end of the speech, where he basically says there are three possible paths uh, for, for the, uh, the, the freedmen or for the blacks in America. And this is on page 165. And uh, he basically says the first is colonization, the second is separation, and the third is assimilation and unification with the great body of the American people. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know he like you know like Lincoln, he thinks that uh, that colonization is a species of pipe dream, and uh, if it were even good, uh, but it's certainly impossible. He thinks separation will be a disaster um, for blacks. And uh, he says it'll make them uh, like the Indian. Uh, it's the Indian policy to be separate. And uh, I think his exact words are, separation will mean extinction. <laughs> and uh, th therefore the only, the only uh, you know, viable alternative is assimilation and unification with the great body of the American people. And, uh, and even the granting uh, and the presence of civil rights, uh, even the protection, the, the good protection and public opinion and law of civil rights doesn't bring that about uh, because basically it seems like what his position is is that only when you get like a, uh, a, a country that is beyond black and white by which I mean like there's so much intermarrying that there's no difference anymore. You actually have assimilation. And, uh, and I, th I think there's no prospect of that happening uh, in his mind or in, uh, in reality. Oh. Um, 
Go ahead. Okay, now I was going to say on that point. On that point, I disagree. Um, there, there's a <clears throat> there's a, uh, an, an editorial um, that's not long after this. I think it's 1886. Uh, that's that's titled "The Future of the Colored Race," and Douglas is. And this is the question of social equality, which was intensely controversial. It was a very highly sensitive subject in, in, uh, in US racial politics, especially in the later 19th century. And, uh, and Douglas says, I'm, I'm asked for my prediction. And he even kind of stumbles over himself to say, now I don't want to be understood to be advocating this, but he says, you know, here's what I think is going to happen a long time in the future, granted, this is not going to happen in any nearly foreseeable future from his point of view. But he says, what I think is going to happen is that the Americans are going to wind up being a blended nationality, was his phrase. And, and that means what Scott said a, a minute ago, that means that means full assimilation, the, the older word is amalgamation, meaning intermarriage, you know, meaning, uh, meaning uh, the, <clears throat> the, 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 the production of of interracial quote unquote interracial offspring uh, uh you know like i mean so in that sense douglas sees himself uh as uh, in a certain way as a uh, as a kind of representative of the of the future american uh and and so he, he sees an america in which there's a, people are divided by almost you know on the on the boundaries imperceptible gradations of uh, of of skin color but again that's that's long in the future so i don't want to say that i i, I fully disagree because i don't with what scott said that that this is i wouldn't call it a pipe dream in his mind he thought it was going to happen but he thought it was going to be you know a, a very it was going to happen very gradually over a long period of time but the thing to be emphasized in this is that when he says uh, in that speech, you know, the future of the colored race, that I don't want to be understood to be advocating this. Well, of course he was advocating that. I mean, Douglas was married to a white woman at this, uh, at, at this point, and, there, and that, there was some controversy about it, and his response to the controversy was essentially, it's none of your damn business who I, who I want to get married to. But the larger point is that Douglas, and this, this I think touches a little better than I did uh, in my in my previous remark, in in answer to the to the question about the factors today that uh, that, that tend to sustain our uh, our race related controversies, a couple of things about that. One is that Douglas thought, uh, I think this was implied in what Scott said too. Douglas thought it was a big big mistake for people who want to present themselves as racial reformers. Um, to, to take positions that intensify people's race consciousness or color consciousness. So what we know as identity politics, I think Douglas would say is a terrible, terrible mistake on the part of, uh, of those who purport to be anti-racist. I say he would say that, but you can say it more strongly than that. He did say that. There's a look up the speech, <clears throat> last speech he ever gave, uh, I mean, last really major speech he gave in his life was September of 1894, called The Blessings of Liberty and Education. And uh, one of the things he says in there is that there's a lot of talk uh, these days, this, you know, 1890s <clears throat> era of racial Darwinism. There's, <clears throat> there's a lot of talk uh, about race, about preservation of race identity, uh, and so forth. And he says, you know, I'm going to say something and he's addressing uh, uh, some of his uh, um, uh, colleagues, I guess you could say, in a kind of black elite, the educated elite, who are making this argument. Uh, he said, "I'm going to say something that's more useful than palatable. You know, that this is a huge mistake. You know, we should not have race is not the basis of rights. You know, only humanity is the is the basis of rights. And so I think, you know, Douglas would say." The, the turn that is taken in racial equality advocacy after the civil rights era toward multiculturalism, toward identity politics and so forth, he would say is entirely wrongheaded. And a second point, and I'll shut up for a while after this, is that um, I think Douglas would be disappointed at the character of our political discussion about race maybe for a number of reasons, but especially for this one, I think Douglas thought that whatever is 
in the private minds or hearts of white Americans with regard to race prejudice. After black Americans have fully enforced and secured voting rights, those prejudices are gonna be effectively ruled out of the public square, that they, they will lose entirely their public respectability once politicians have to compete for the black vote. And that's all to the good. I mean, that's his prediction and that seems to me um, pretty much sustained by the evidence. But he also anticipated, you can find this in his speech called What the Black Man Wants in uh, 1865, that there's gonna be a tendency toward a kind of paternalism, uh, a racial paternalism on the part of white politicians. He saw it in 1865, I think he would see it today and he objected to it then, it seems to me he'd probably find it objectionable now. So with that, I, uh, I, I yield. All right, uh, another question from our audience. Joe Rooney asks, <clears throat> what was Douglas's reaction to Supreme Court cases like, uh, the, like Slaughterhouse and the civil rights cases compared to the reaction of the general public? You talk about Douglas, I can talk about the general public. <laughs> All right, that's good. I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. Um, in, uh, as far as I know, he said a little, not a lot about the slaughterhouse cases. Um, he didn't like the ruling because um, Douglas was, as you can imagine, not a huge proponent of the, the constitutional state's rights argument in any kind of strong form. And so he sees maybe trouble afoot in the, uh, in, the, in the slaughterhouse cases ruling. But on the other hand, the court said in slaughterhouse that rejecting the claim of the butchers, if you, if you know the case, which had on its face nothing to do with race, uh, the court said, really, we're, uh, we're casting doubt on this claim by this group of butchers um, because the main purpose of the 14th Amendment was to vindicate the rights of the, of the free people, of the class of people formerly enslaved. And so <laughs> you could read that and think, well, okay, you know, there's a state's rights against this claim by a bunch of white butchers, but maybe they'll be different with regard to claims by, uh, by civil rights plaintiffs. So he's, you know, I think not really ready to give up hope for the Supreme Court uh, after the slaughterhouse cases. But the civil rights cases, that's another matter. In uh, the civil rights cases of 1883, I'll say just a tiny word about that. I'm not sure everybody listening is familiar with those, with those cases. Um, it's, it's a case that comes up with a group of private business owners, owners of what would be classified as public accommodations like uh, uh, like transportation conveyances, restaurants, theaters, things like that, hotels. And uh, <clears throat> the, the law in question is the 1875 Civil Rights Act, which essentially outlawed race discrimination in access to public accommodations. And that gets challenged immediately by owners of such accommodations who want to discriminate on grounds of race. So it finds its way to the Supreme Court. The court rules on it in 1883. And what it says is that the Civil Rights Act of 1875 is unconstitutional, essentially because the Civil Rights Act, um, the, the, that provision of it, I mean, this was really the thrust of it, that, uh, that mandated, that prohibited race discrimination by private parties was beyond the power of the Congress as conferred by the 14th Amendment. The, the court's reading of the 14th Amendment was that the 14th Amendment prohibits racially discriminatory action by state authorities, governmental authorities, but not by private parties. And so Douglas gave a speech about that in October of 1883, in which he said that very interesting speech. He said he thought the court got it wrong, and he, but he didn't really dwell too much on the constitutional argument. He dwelled mainly on what he thought was the moral significance, and he thought the case was about as bad as, as Dred Scott. He thought the case was um, 
was was really lar the ruling was was against the larger spirit of the 14th Amendment, which was to vindicate the rights of free people and doesn't make a whole lot of difference who's going to be violating them as long as there are violations that uh, that are allowed to stand. Um, so he thought that this was really a calamity. And, you know, again, this was the speech I'm talking about now. He gave just a few months after the one we're talking about tonight with regard to the, the U.S. can't remain half slave and half free. So it, it deepened his, uh, his near term um, despondency about developments. One of the things he said in that civil rights cases speech is that uh, um, we have been wounded in the house of our friends. What he meant by that is the Supreme Court at this point is composed entirely of Republican Party appointees. And, uh, and the Supreme Court has still decided to interpret the Reconstruction Amendments in this relatively narrow way. And, um, and so the, the, you know, the trajectory of even Republican authorities is kind of downhill. Uh, and uh, so in the near term, uh, that was, uh, uh, that was that was jolting for him. I mean, he thought that was a, a really big, really important, and really disappointing ruling. Republican appointees not acting up. Uh, I thought the first one was David Souter, but I guess it's been going on for more than a century. Huh? Yeah, no, it was all the only one. I, Justice Harlan was yeah. one of Douglas's heroes, and yeah. uh, Harlan wrote the only wrote the only dissent, which Douglas draws upon. In uh, in the speech that he the yes. speech that he gave, he wanted Harlan to run for president. Um, he was uh, he was uh, he was he was very supportive of Harlan. But yeah. that was it. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, my understanding of the general public is just kind of following the election returns and the um, political convention uh, platforms of the parties. And uh, there was a marked cooling of the Republican Party between 1868 when Grant was first elected. There was a split in the Republican Party in 1872, yeah. Yeah. where uh, I think they were called the liberal Republicans yeah. broke off and, uh, and ran, and I think got maybe 11% of the vote, but the uh, occupation of the South still uh, delivered the presidency to Grant in a pretty decisive way. But then over the course of that term, uh, Grant kind of to appease those members of his party, um, you know, pulled out most of the uh, from the South. There was still only a few, two or three states where it was left in 1876. And, uh, and I think that was just in response to basic Northern, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to say diffidence, but, uh, you know, uh, backtracking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, they were sick of the issue. Uh, they thought it probably couldn't work occupying the South and, and a kind of colonial model wasn't something that Americans really wanted to do. And, uh, and you know, having the headlines every day be about uh, the attacks on troops and the attacks on freedmen in the South made it seem like it was an impossible problem and there was a pulling out. So, um, so I think the Supreme so, Court- So this was, Af this was Afghanistan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Supreme Court followed the election returns, I would say, uh, when it came to the Reconstruction Amendments. And, uh, and, and therefore, I think there is a big wedge between uh, Douglas's views and, uh, and the general population. You know, there were no opinion polls, so the best you have, have to look at are what politicians thought the public was about and how the public reacted to it. Yeah, and, well, uh, and along, with, along with newspaper accounts, was, yeah. it, you know, was it a huge, big story that these rulings were, were handed down? And so far as I know, it really wasn't. Um, it, same with Plessy versus Ferguson was, I mean, you know, is looked upon now as this, this tremendous outrage in constitutional interpretation, and it was it was hardly noticed uh, at the time when it was when it was handed down. Yeah, and the only exception to that is the Cruikshank decision in 1876. There was such a huge massacre um, that, uh, and Grant really made it his final stand uh, of his presidency to enforce. Um, you know, the, the federal law against the 50 uh, men who were killed by uh, the various uh, forces in Louisiana around Colfax. Mm -hmm. uh, they had gunboats, you know, they had the army occupying it, and they still couldn't, they, they got a conviction, and then it was overturned by the court. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that really ended any possibility of there being, uh, you know, a northern presence uh, on the colonial model in the south. Well, yeah, and they didn't—they didn't control the Congress at that point. Um, 
uh, anymore after after 1874. So yeah. they they passed the they passed the 1875 Civil Rights Act mainly because Charles Sumner died and they wanted to do a certain kind of honor to him. But then, as everybody knows, it was going to be uh, well, what it was going to be more than 80 years uh, before before Congress would pass another Civil Rights Act. Richard Rago asks, uh, were federal troops also removed from the South in time for the railroad strikes? And was, uh, was this why railroad owners and Northern capitalists tended not to criticize the new policy? If you got something about that, Scott, you fire I away. Not, I, I do I not don't. know the answer to that. Uh, my guess is the person who posed the question might know an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah, that kind of sounds like that to me. But uh, yeah, I do. I do not know the answer to that question. John, you might know the answer. You're, you're... I, I, I do not. Uh, the Reconstruction is not my uh, is not my era. Uh, I don't remember here's... it being in the Foner book. I mean, that's uh, the the gold standard for these books. So. Well, I mean, look, the, the promise would have. My sense is the strike, the, you know, the big the, the big strike of 1877 didn't happen until later that year, after the promise would have been made by uh, by Hayes, right? So I, I, I'm I'm spitballing here, but I think that's that's probably right. Uh, Barbara Markham asks, do you ever pair this speech with one that followed the decision on the civil rights cases? Uh, would you say that Douglas over that begins to lose some of his optimism? I do not pair them, but uh, that's only because I lack time. Peter teaches more uh, African American political thought, I think. Yeah, I don't have tremendous time, you know, to do when I when I teach the mag course on Douglas. That course that course is devoted to Douglas's autobiographies, um, and in his autobiography, he actually in his third one he actually prints in full text his uh, his speech. On the civil rights cases, so that's that's his estimation of uh, of the importance of that occasion, and the speech. He doesn't print the 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 DC uh, the anniversary of the DC emancipation speech, but I think it is uh, you can you could pair those speeches, but really what he says in the DC emancipation speech, I mean I think it's a very well crafted speech, is kind of representative of things that he was saying. But in in regard to the 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 later part of your of your question, does he begin to get to, to get pessimistic? No, I don't think so. I don't think Douglas was really never pessimistic. Um, uh, and you know, this was this is kind of the arc of the moral universe argument again. But I think Douglas thought that there are solid reasons to think that over the long haul, uh, America will be a reformed country with regard to race relations. And he says that, you know, partly because of this kind of natural law moral sense argument we were talking about a while ago, partly because it's written into the constitution, but he thinks the trajectory of American history does support this. Uh, that, uh, I mean, beginning at the time of the revolution uh, where, where slavery is permitted in every state and then after the revolution, there is a wave of um, uh, uh, emancipation in the northern states. And uh, you can say to that, well, that slavery's presence was relatively slight in most of them. It was a relatively easy thing to do. It's a portion of truth in that. But slavery's presence wasn't simply slight everywhere. It wasn't all that slight in New York, for instance. Um, and. Uh, and the fact remains still they did it. And that emancipation, the, the first wave of emancipation, was the biggest emancipation in human history up to that point. So that's not nothing. Uh, then go forward, you know, with some twists and turns to the Civil War era. And it, one of, uh, if you want the, the, the best statement, the most remarkably striking statement of Douglas's optimism, look at his speech on the Dred Scott ruling, um, because he says that. Uh, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing now, I'm, I'm injecting my own, uh, my own language, but this is essentially the gist of it. There's every reason to be pessimistic now. You know, the, the US Congress a few years ago with the Fugitive Slave Law passed the most pro-slavery act in Congress's history. Now in 1857, you've got the most pro-slavery reading of the constitution ever handed down by the US Supreme Court. All of the institutions of the federal government are on the side of the slaveholders. We've been at this for 30 years, we abolitionists, and what do we have? We got nothing. 
You know, there's there's abundant reason for gloom. And Douglas says in response to that decision, my hopes are never brighter than they are right now. And his argument was that what they've done here is an outrage and it will be recognized as such. It is an overreach and the North is going to react to this. Six years later, Emancipation Proclamation, you know, and so Douglas sees these things and and uh, um, and says, you know, the the. History is, is in a way unpredictable. And uh, uh, there are sudden reversals. Some of them are bad, but there are sudden reversals in history. Uh, and, uh, and over time, you know, progressive things have happened that you never would have expected just a few years, just a few years before. And so that's, but, but over the long term, he says, the tendency of the American people is toward reform. And history bears that out. Uh, and the progress of the freed people, even since 1863, with regard to literacy, with regard to the accumulation of property, even in the 1880s, was really kind of remarkable. And, uh, uh, and so I think Douglas thinks there's empirical reason to be, to be hopeful, despite all the, 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 uh, the obstacles. Scott, care to add anything to that? No, thank you. I mean, I just like Peter's drinking from the Packer mug. So. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> So, go back, uh, go, back, go. As we uh, near the end of our hour, I like to end with a question, of, uh, in a way that, that that invites us to go back to the original question, right? We have a we have an audience of 160 odd people, most of which are most of whom are, are likely teachers. Uh, what's your best argument that you would make to them to find time in their school curricula? to squeeze in this, this speech? I guess I would say uh, very few speeches, none that I'm aware of, uh, raise the issue of what constitutes progress um, more uh, on race matters more directly than Douglas. What's the realistic understanding of what progress is uh, in race relations? Uh, he grounds it in, you know, a time that uh, that Americans think is a very dark time, and uh, and he, I think, maintains, uh, uh, you know, a, I'm going to say a statesmanlike or a, a philosophical uh, distance from all the passions that are being um, uh, aroused at the particular time, and really tries to give an even-handed account of what progress means uh, in this particular matter. Um, what its limits are and what, uh, what can reasonably hope be hoped to achieve. Uh, there's very little of that in politics uh, these days where everything is over-promising. And, uh, and I think Douglas, uh, Douglas strikes a kind of model uh, for how to approach the question of what can reasonably be expected. I would, I would add a kind of a simple and general thing to that, that uh, uh, I think in one of the things you have in Douglas uh, is, uh, you know, just in addition to the fact that he's, uh, uh, I mean, he's, he's the most able expositor of his, uh, of, of his cause in really the whole of the 19th century, which is good enough to, to, to include a lot of things that, uh, that Douglas said and wrote, is um, that Douglas is, first of all, um, somebody you know, very ardently interested in pushing the cause of justice in race relations. And he has enormous credibility as somebody who suffered from injustice in race relations. So that's a powerful reason to include him. And the argument here in the speech is, um, I mean, I, I would really emphasize this moral government of the universe argument that, that we can understand in principle how to be on the right side of this issue so far as we keep our positions grounded in the idea that there's a law of nature, that there are natural human rights, and that this is the cause that we're, uh, that we're, really, trying to, that we're really trying to vindicate. And the natural human rights are rooted in um, the legacy of the, of the American founding. You know, so you got Douglas, uh, in a certain sense, a radical on race relations, but grounding his position in the principles of the founding for which he has very deep respect. And uh, I think uh, we could 
benefit by a little more of that from uh, uh, from uh, those uh, those who fly the flag of anti-racism today. Well, that's all the time we have. I want to thank both of our panelists, uh, as well as our participants for some great questions. As a reminder, you will each be receiving an email within the next week. That email will include a link for a certificate of participation. It will also contain a link to the archived webinar, and we hope you will share that link with your colleagues as well as on social media. Help us please get the word out. If you have enjoyed tonight's webinar, please consider taking an online graduate course in our Master of Arts in American History and Government program. You can find more information about our course offerings, both online and in person, as well as many other resources for teachers at teachingamericanhistory.org. Our next episode of Documents in Detail will take place on the evening of Wednesday, February 16th when our topic will be Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms Address. That comes from the core document volume on World War II. And here to talk about it with us on that occasion will be Dr. Jennifer Keene of Chapman University. Uh, Dr. Keene is also editor of that volume. And Dr. David Krugler of the University of Wisconsin at Platteville. Thanks for being with us tonight. And we look forward to seeing you again on February 16th. Thanks as always for listening. You can learn more about our documents collections, our programs, and our online resources at teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org.